It hasn't been a typical day for an older adult living in North Simcoe, Muskoka for months. COVID-19 leaving many seniors alone in their homes and with visiting being restricted in hospitals, long-term care homes and in retirement homes. Loneliness and social isolation for our aging population is sadly nothing new, but the pandemic is making it worse. One in five Canadians, mainly older adults, experience some degree of loneliness. In those over 85 years, the rate of loneliness is as high as 25%. We had troubles with social isolation and loneliness in our older adults long before COVID-19, and I fear that we're going to have trouble with that after. The North Simcoe Muskoka Specialized Geriatric Services Program, working in partnership with Waypoint Center for Mental Health Care, supports older adults and their care partners to better manage challenges like cognitive impairment and other mental health issues. Concern about depression and anxiety is growing as this COVID-19 pandemic drags on, and a question is raised. Do these symptoms always need medication? And what's contributing to depression and anxiety? Answers to these questions help us understand how to manage these symptoms. So it's correct that it is the feeling of loneliness rather than the quantity of social isolation that has the negative impact on mental health, physical health, and even healthcare utilization. And it's important to remember that it is perceived loneliness over a long time that is studied. Social isolation is a global concern amid COVID-19, with concerns that this will lead to declining mental health in those most vulnerable. For, for many folks, uh, those routines have been disrupted. You know, going out to uh, coffee groups or drop-in social groups like they normally participated in, or day programs if they did that. Um, all of those things have stopped or ended or have changed form. So um, it can be um, a harder time for somebody who is living with dementia. Here's how loneliness and social isolation can affect physical health, early mortality, stroke, elevated blood pressure, and malnutrition. It can also affect mental health with depression, risk of suicide, or even substance misuse. So in yourself, or if you're a caregiver, Look for the core features of a major clinical depression, and that includes a sustained sad, sadness or depression uh, over time. It includes a lack of interest in doing things, not just apathetic, but actually not enjoying. It includes worse appetite, an increase or decrease in sleep, things like that. It also, in the older adult, includes irritability and what we call somatic preoccupation or a preoccupation with physical symptoms, more and more consumed and complaining about physical stuff. That's a huge feature. So look for that through these times. Some people, when um, you're faced with a high stress situation, um, you might turn to different coping strategies that perhaps aren't as helpful to your overall health and wellness. So um, sometimes we look at self-medicating with over-the-counter prescription, over-the-counter medication or prescription drugs or alcohol. Um, and some, and in many cases for the older adult, those types of um, medications, for lack of a better word, can actually lead to increased confusion. During this period of high stress and social or physical isolation, the caregiver may also see periods of loneliness or even depression. And so for those caregivers, it's, it is difficult to help support somebody who's living with loneliness. And in fact, that can contribute to you feeling isolated and therefore you feeling lonely. And so it is so important as caregivers that you still maintain some of your social connections. Uh, perhaps again by phone, um, being involved in those groups that have formerly um, always been a support to you, those things are still really important things to tap into. Social isolation has a similar impact on mortality as smoking and alcohol misuse. It exceeds the risks associated with obesity and inactivity. There are so many ways in which we can all combat uh, loneliness. Uh, starting even firstly with maintaining good daily routines, um, setting goals, setting small goals. So I'm going to get up every day at 9 a.m. and I'm going to start off the day with a healthy breakfast. Getting outside, getting some activities. So reach out to your social community by phone or by video conferencing virtually. That means that computers and cell phones these days have cameras and have the capacity to create video conferencing so you can see the person as you talk to them. 
if you don't know how to do this, ask. Your family could help you with this. I always say ask the younger generation because they all know this stuff because it allows you to reach out and, and fight against the isolation by keeping a social connectedness uh, and that's exquisitely important during this time. So all the supports that somebody would have accessed prior to COVID are, are still there, um, albeit a little bit uh, in, a, in a different form. So when I think of our services at the Alzheimer's Society, we've moved all of our options online um, or through telephone. So for somebody who used to uh, receive supportive counseling through our services, um, a lot of that was done over telephone pre-COVID, so that's still happening, and now people have the option of having virtual visits. Um, our support groups are, off, are, are uh, being offered online, as well as all, all of our education and social rec programs. Social engagement is an important part of life for everybody. At this time, our usual way of touching, hugging, and engaging has changed. For many older adults, these changes, coupled with increased social isolation, are threatening their health and sense of well-being. As the world begins to reopen, the North Simcoe Muskoka Specialized Geriatric Services hopes the new normal includes a better appreciation of the impact of social isolation and loneliness on people's health. They also hope that people will make a conscious effort to spend more time with our older population. This is what we're used to seeing in some of our older adults. Walkers and canes help steady many of them as they move from place to place. For many, it's a walk down the street. For even more, it's just a walk to another area of the house. In older adults, mobility or walking can deteriorate with age. As mobility declines, the risk of falls increases. Dr. Amanda Guardhouse is a geriatrician, which is a doctor that specializes in caring for older adults. She sees many patients who have fallen or who are at risk of falling. I would say with seniors health, there's a lot of issues that are common to older adults. And certainly uh, as we get older, we're more likely to experience um, multi -mor multi morbidity or multiple diseases. Um, some of the things we commonly are consulted for or are seen for is dementia, um, also falls, um, bone health is something that also goes up there and frailty. So, you know, uh, things that have, you know, a multifaceted approach, that's generally what, uh, as geriatricians that we tend to focus on is a lot of different issues that could be contributing to health, health issues and health needs. Falls are the leading cause of injuries that land seniors in the hospital, according to a 2019 report from the Canadian Institute for Health Information. The data collected from participating hospitals across the country shows that roughly 138,000 people aged 65 and older were hospitalized for injuries between April 1, 2017 and March 31, 2018. 81% were hurt in a fall. Dr. Gardhouse says the fall is the first clue that something else may be wrong. I mean, there's upwards of 400 risk factors for falls. I like to break it down to things that we're sort of in control of and things that we're not in control of. So things that are intrinsic to us that put us at risk for falls would be sort of chronic health conditions like osteoarthritis, like having had a stroke, like dementia or memory loss. Um, but things that are outside of us that we can probably better control are things like medications we're taking for our diseases, things like alcohol use, uh, and things like the environment. So making sure that everything within the home is nice and safe is key. And we have wonderful colleagues in the occupational and physiotherapy fields that, that can provide recommendations regarding home safety and environmental safety. Falls are often caused by immobility and not enough activity. According to Stats Canada, only 14% of adults aged 65 to 79 are meeting the Canadian guidelines of 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity a week. Being sedentary increases the older adults' chances of requiring assistance for daily living. It also increases the chances of falls. First of all, yes, falls is not a normal part of aging, so it's really important to, important to know. Um, most falls risk factors that are identified um, are modifiable. 
Shirlene Wells is a physiotherapist with the North Simcoe Muskoka Specialized Geriatric Services Program, a program offered in partnership with Waypoint Center for Mental Health Care. She says immobility isn't just contributing to the risk of falls, it's also a risk of functional decline. So functional decline basically translates um, into a decline in what activities they are able to do, their daily tasks that they're able to do every day. So it could be um, just mobilizing, it could be transferring, it could be getting dressed, it could be bathing. So those functional activities that we all do in a frail senior, it becomes more more complex, more difficult, and um, you'll see that decline over time, so functional decline. So if you notice the, the a functional decline, um, I would recommend the first thing to do would maybe discuss that with your primary care provider, um, just to rule out uh, any um, acute medical concerns uh, or issues that may have developed. Um, and beyond that, um, with that person being aware of the um, problems you're having, they can make the appropriate recommendations and per, um, refer you on to um, the care that's needed, perhaps our program, for example, so we can go in and do our comprehensive geriatric assessment and make the recommendations specific to um, our findings. So now that we know the problem, what's the solution? Exercise is key. Teresa Hind is a kinesiologist with the North Simcoe Muskoka Specialized Geriatric Services Program and teaching older adults how to exercise is what she loves. The idea with us is that we're encouraging everybody to be physically active um, no matter what, so as much or as little as you can, and then also making sure that you come out to maybe a program. Um, it's never too late to get active and it's definitely going to have benefits that accumulate for you. Our normal program is the CARE exercise program run uh, through SGS and it's run in several different locations. Um, it's two days a week generally for two hours long, so it's something that gives everybody a chance to really come in and, and be a part of a group uh, to be active as well as we do some cognitive training so to kind of make sure that our brains getting uh, worked as well. The exercises are simple and using light movements to help get the blood pumping. And then we're encouraging things like marching on the spot is great, you can change the speed, you can go wide, you can come in narrow. Um, if people are able, we encourage that they would uh, move their arms as well. So things like raising straight up or back down, um, coming out to the side and up as able are some other movements that you could try and do. For those who want to be active, Dr. Gardhouse says find something that works for you and have fun. Something else that we that we often use in clinic, but also sort of in general conversation with folks is that, you know, uh, if you don't use it, you lose it. And so that, that really speaks and rings true for a lot of folks, that if we're not as active on a day-to-day -day basis, we're more likely to experience functional decline. So you really have to be very deliberate about getting exercise, about going out there, sort of challenging yourself day-to-day -day in order to maintain our, our strength and endurance as we get older. And challenging yourself to be more mobile will pay off in your overall physical, mental, and emotional health. get older, medications are often prescribed to help support both age-related concerns as well as medical conditions. For example, diabetes, high blood pressure, COPD, and glaucoma. As a result, managing medications is a daily task for most older adults, and sometimes they're caregivers too. People must know what medications they are on, what they look like, what they're for, and when to take them, and how to take them properly. Doctors, nurse practitioners, and pharmacists work closely with older adults and caregivers to ensure they are on the right medication to meet their needs and to help them manage their medications. While medication can be necessary, older adults are at greater risk of polypharmacy, which is the use of multiple drugs at the same time. So polypharmacy is a term that we use to um, talk about patients who take too many medications. And so in older adults, uh, two-thirds of patients take 
more than five medications, which is considered polypharmacy. Um, and over a third, sorry, almost a third of patients take uh, over 10 medications, which is just lots of medications on those patients. And the concern with that is that you start to get an increased risk of interactions um, or uh, uh, extra side effects, additive side effects. And so we really want to be looking at those cases and those people that are taking more than five medications to make sure that all of them are needed and all of them are, are safe for those patients when they're used together. How many medications are older adults taking? In a recent study, it was found that 66% of older adults take more than five daily medications, while 27% take more than 10. For older adults, this can be a concern. So as we get older, uh, our bodies change. Uh, so as a result, the way we respond to medications and the way we clear medications, it changes. So for example, sleeping pills. Someone may be taking a sleeping pill for 30 years. However, over time, because of uh, their body's uh, ability to uh, clear the medications is less, that sleeping pill can hang around a little bit more. Okay. Not only that, but we know that as you get older, we're more sensitive to certain medications. And as a result, that medication might start to interfere with how clear our thinking is. Sometimes what happens is medications end up being prescribed for side effects related to other medications. So we can end up getting into what's known as a prescribing cascade. So more medications can be added um, to combat side effects of, of current medications. So that can be problematic. Because older adults often see many healthcare providers that prescribe medications, it is important to keep an accurate list of all current medication, which is more difficult to get than you would think. Unfortunately, those doctors don't have access to the most up-to-date lists necessarily. So sometimes a specialist you're seeing will start a medication thinking it's perfectly safe, but the list that they're working off of that you they, of the medications you take is actually an older version. And so there might be an interaction or some side effects that are additive um, with the new medication they're starting with an old one. Some of the ways that we can prevent medication-related concerns as we get older is to make sure we have an up-to-date medication list, um, make sure that we understand why we're taking all of the medications, um, and ask questions if we're not sure. Uh, make sure that you visit one pharmacy so that they can keep an accurate record of all of your medications rather than having um, prescriptions filled at multiple places. That helps with assessing for ongoing need of medications as well as screening for side effects and interactions. When we think about medications, we often only think about the prescription pills, but we should also think about the inhalers, injections, drops and sprays, as well as medicated ointments, creams, and patches we put on our skin. Dr. Joanne Ho says older adults and their caregivers need to look at all medications. So what we often uh, want to know about is what is the patient taking? All the medications, not just the ones that are on the list, uh, all or not just the ones that are on the blister pack, but what about those over-the-counter medications? You know, um, are there any anti-inflammatory medications that may help with pain uh, and fever, but sometimes as we get older, we know it can cause a little bit more harm than good. We want to know about all the medications being taken. And when I say medications, I think I should also include all natural health products, uh, all alcohol, smoking, and cannabis. Regular checkups with your healthcare team and seeing the same pharmacist is a good way to make sure the medications you take are right for you. Sometimes it makes sense to de-prescribe or stop medications when the risk may be more than the benefit. The end goal is how can we help the patient achieve what they want? So I always start with how can I help you? It doesn't always need to be medication. Sometimes it's pulling back medication. Sometimes it's encouraging uh, what we call non-pharmacologic measures. Uh, so different ways of helping without adding medication. Sometimes it's 
exercise, you know, making sure that person is, uh, doesn't have sleep apnea, uh, making sure that person is, uh, is, is able to get out and be active uh, from a physical but also a mind perspective. The North Simcoe Muskoka Specialized Geriatric Services Program provides comprehensive care for older adults in the region. The SGS partners with Jerry Medrisk, a team that specializes in optimizing the use of medications for seniors in the province of Ontario. When it comes to aging, many people will chalk confusion up to the aging process, but it's not always the cause. In normal aging, the brain does shrink in size. As people get older, they will experience, for example, a decrease in the speed of processing or how fast you do things and how fast you process information. Attention can be affected, especially when there are multiple things going on at once. Mental flexibility and abstract thinking also change. You may forget a name or where you put your keys. Generally, changes are subtle and deteriorate over time. Confusion, beyond that, caused by normal aging changes, needs to be examined. It can occur in older adults of any age, with early onset dementia occurring in people even in their 50s. Some causes of confusion can be more serious and reflect severe underlying medical issues in the older adult. So confusion is, um, you know, probably the bread and butter of a lot of what I see. Um, but, you know, very quickly we have to figure out, you know, am I looking at confusion that's been there for months or years? And I'm just trying to clarify sort of what is the cause of that? Or am I looking at that confusion that came on very suddenly and I'm looking for you know, another medical cause. There's definitely different uh, reasons why one might be confused. Um, certainly those causes can be both physical in nature, it could be changes to their environment or their home situation. Uh, so it's really important that when somebody is presenting with some confusion, really trying to understand what might be the cause of that. So taking it back to looking at what has changed. Within the NSM SGS program, with Waypoint as its lead agency, when we assess confusion, we look for a variety of possible causes like delirium, dementia, mental health conditions, substance use, and medical conditions. Delirium is a medical emergency and requires medical attention. 50% of older adults in hospital have had an episode. In delirium, you can see a sudden increase in confusion, and the confusion may come and go throughout the day. The older adult can sometimes become agitated, and sometimes there can be hallucinations or seeing things that aren't there. It can occur with things like chest or bladder infections, a change in medication, anesthetic, and pain. Um, we don't know exactly what causes delirium, but what we do know is that when the body is really stressed, in particular from you know a medical illness, that a bunch of you know hormones and chemicals and things that are released in the body as part of that stress response, and it seems to break down the pathways in the brain that let the different areas of the brain talk to one another, and so all of a sudden the brain's not working properly. You know, you know, there's really two factors that can influence it. One is how vulnerable somebody's brain is, and obviously. Um, as you get older and you've had, you know, a lifetime of things that could happen to the brain and hardening of the arteries and, and other things that can sort of make the brain not function as well, then it can be a little bit more vulnerable. When the cause of delirium is resolved, the confusion usually improves. But in some cases, it can take time. And in some other cases, things never return to the way they were before. A second cause of confusion is dementia. Dementia is an umbrella term, meaning that there are a variety of diseases that fall under that term. The most familiar one is Alzheimer's disease, but there are other types like Lewy body dementia, vascular dementia, and frontal lobe dementia. But whenever we look at all the causes of confusion, we must also consider medical conditions, mental health conditions, and substance use too. I mean, dementia is the most common reason for confusion that happens sort of um, you know, just slowly and over time, but anything that causes the brain to degrade can cause the same kind of thing. So 
Um, you know, Parkinson's disease, and there's several variants of that can cause it. There's a series of dementias that are called frontal temporal dementia that can cause it. Uh, Alzheimer's disease, of course, would be one of the most common things. But then there's a whole bunch of other things that can mimic um, uh, dementia that we need to sort of rule out. There's, um, you know, some infections um, like, you know, variants of mad cow disease and things like that that can cause it. Um, you know, people that have sleep apnea. Some people, when um, you're faced with a high stress situation, um, you might turn to different coping strategies that perhaps aren't as helpful to your overall health and wellness. So um, sometimes we looked at self-medicating with over-the-counter prescription, over-the-counter medication or prescription drugs or alcohol. Um, and some, and in many cases for the older adult, those types of um, medications, for lack of a better word, can actually lead to increased confusion. Confusion in the older adult can cause stress on the individual themselves, on the caregiver and family and friends. There are a variety of ways to engage with someone who is confused. For healthcare professionals, it's all about communication. So I think it's really important to kind of provide some reassurance, right? Really kind of ad identifying yourself, introducing yourself as somebody that might be uh, a safe person that they can talk to. Um, really trying to understand what's going on. So having some conversation, exploring what they're feeling, what's happening, uh, just trying to get some information because once we have a bit more context, we can certainly kind of respond, right? So really that reassuring, calm voice, very soft approach. Can confusion be prevented? The Alzheimer's Society of Simcoe County says regular routine and healthy lifestyle is key. So we look at um, staying physically active. We know what's good for our body is good for our brain. So when we exercise, we're increasing blood flow and we, we want to do that for the, the cells in our brain to keep them nourished and, and, and healthy. So getting daily exercise is a good strategy. Eating well is also important that we consider what we're putting into our body to feed ourselves is also feeding the our brain and feeding our brain cells. So um, getting foods that are rich in antioxidants. Staying cognitively active is another way to keep your brain strong. Puzzles and other games stimulate your brain and can keep you as healthy as possible. For older adults who are experiencing confusion or for family and friends who are seeing confusion, make sure you have a conversation with a member of your health team this could be your doctor, nurse, pharmacist, or physiotherapist. For all older adults, the NSM-SGS program encourages you to keep your brain active and healthy for life.